Hey, trying one last video from the lovely days in Dilly, where I was just visited by Dilly's finest after a 911 call I made regarding shotgun blasts, um, which just kept repeating. Not regularly, but very close by, and uh, very powerful. You can almost feel the kickback. And I was not the only person who called it in, I'm glad to say, because it ended up that some idiot was blowing off, you know, setting off fireworks, like full-scale fireworks. So, you know, happy Bastille Day to whatever French freak lives in Dilly, Texas. Um, bonjour, mes amis. Anyway, that was a weird thing to have happen. Um, and kind of helped me see just how rattled I am. Um, anyway, I think I'm gonna do more videos to process this simply because I started this journey. And I know I'll be processing it when I get back. Um, I started this journey doing video and I feel like I should finish it in the same format. Hopefully once all of whatever this voice crud and dragon in my chest are, but also, I'm sure you've noticed and been very nice not to mention that my face is swollen up like a tick. Um, I have the feet of a pregnant woman right now. I am retaining so much water. Um, I don't know, if it's probably a combination of things, stress and flying and an all taco diet. Um, <laughs> uh, but I really hope it gets to right itself um, once I'm back in Nashville. sleepy, but I feel like I need to do justice to the last two clients I saw. And I saw only two clients between 7.30 and 8, 7.30 a.m., 8 p.m., um, because they were both really labor-intensive. Um, the first one was actually a holdover from yesterday. I mentioned, um, something about Guatemala City and how it is chaotic evil. And I've since learned that it is barely like the red zones there, which are the slums where all of the gangs sort of coexist because they're like overlapping territories um, or whatever reason. I don't know why they coexist there, but they do. Um, and exploit the poorest people in, in Guatemala. Um, but you know, they may not be coexisting so much given how many murders there are. In any case, you know, in El Salvador, if you see a gang sh shooting, um, they will send you a warning about never ever talking to the police. And if for any reason they think that you're a threat, um, they will just fucking kill you. Um, and if they thought you were a threat before, they will absolutely fucking kill you right then. Whereas in Guatemala, my client had seen more actual murders, countless corpses, but more actual murders um, than uh, she could remember. But she remembered that she had her baby with her for five of them. So, and the very strong understanding is don't say anything. Don't ever say anything. Um, on top of that, she had a horribly abusive domestic relationship. But that had ended, and the guy was leaving her alone. She'd been abused um, all through childhood by a grandmother who beat her whenever she um, acted out, act, acted up, um, did something bad, is what she said. And when I asked for examples of what was bad, she said it usually was if she and her cousin who lived with his grandmother, if they came home from school and started playing in the yard before they went in to do their chores. That would merit a meeting. Um, with a belt. And despite the fact that this woman had to quit her job because 
She was being extorted for so much money that she couldn't afford the ex uh, 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 weekly. That she couldn't afford to pay the um, five quetzale extortion to get on the bus in rush hour on the way to and on the way from work every day as well. Um, speaking of the bus, she reported that she was not masturbated on on the bus every day. Maybe just two or three days a week. It was very crowded, she said. And that was always the excuse they gave. They couldn't help themselves when they were up against such a beautiful, beautiful woman. She is a really beautiful woman. She's a stunningly beautiful woman. She's a woman who would make anybody in their right mind stop and turn around. And uh, as a result, she's had a lot of sexual harassment, of course, but she's had a lot of harassment directed at her because the features that make her so very beautiful are her indigenous features. She has, um, she comes from a small indigenous village in Guatemala the kind who you see on postage, on post stamp, postcards um, that are up in 10,000 villages, right? And, uh, kind of crab. Um, and then she would get horrible comments about her heritage but not enough to, not the sort of discrimination, racial discrimination, that uh, didn't rise to the level of actionable for asylum. Possibly just because she is, I don't let that bother me, she says. And I know where she's coming from, sweetie. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't bother you. And I actually said that to her. Um, so, she has extortion. She has uh, the knowledge that she has missed significant numbers of extortion payments and thus is, a tar is targeted for being shot on sight. She went through her life savings paying for taxis to try to go get a new job um, because she couldn't wait by the bus because she knew she'd die. Um, but the threat is never articulated in Guatemala City. You just know that this is what happens because you've seen it happen to countless other people. But uh, we're kind of looking for that verbal death threat. Um, So yeah, she has all these horrible things. And um, I want, you know, I kept hitting walls. But I know, knew that in whatever case they made, according to the new and more evil guidelines, um, there's a lot of emphasis being put on. Why didn't you go to the cops? And I mean, you could make the argument that, you know, domestic violence and drug violence in particular um, are things that should be handled inside a country. And by God, they should be. They should be handled inside a country, but they're not. And when a country abjectly fails to um, protect a class of people from harm, from real lasting harm and from murder, um, You know, we're basically saying, I'm sorry, your government is completely dysfunctional, possibly because of, you know, decades of puppet regimes and civil wars that we stoked or armed one side or the other in. And, oh, yes, all this cash we keep giving you guys for drugs. Um, sorry about that, but uh, you, your government really needs to handle that on its own. So you go back and you teach them, girl. So... Police. Why don't you go to the police? Why doesn't anybody go to the police? Right? 
in El Salvador, at least, it's a it's suggested that that might be an option, which is why they're so quick to kill you. She said that nobody goes to the police. Everybody knows you don't go to the police. And that one time in uh, the recent year or two, I think, I have to look at my notes and I'm not going to do that. Um, somebody did go to the police. They went to the police about a, a murder that they had witnessed. They named names. They knew who the fuck the gunman was and his affiliations and who his accomplice was. And the gangs, in response to this, apparently acting in concert, um, went through this red zone and um, on motorcycles in the middle of the day and just started massacring people, children, parks, and um, people coming out of church, people waiting at bus stops, anywhere where there's a large group of people they um, they killed everybody, and they tossed down a card, um, postcard kind of thing, I guess, pamphlet, placard, whatever, that said, this is what happens in blah, 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 blah neighborhood when someone goes to the police. This is what we will do. Unfortunately, that is the only part of her case that is bad enough to pass scrutiny. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find. And I went to other attorneys and they went through the case. There's so much there. And it doesn't add up to a valid asylum claim. So when it was lunchtime, she was actually supposed to go to her interview. I went with her. We requested more time for prep. They agreed to give her a reschedule for next week. I won't be with her, but that's okay. Because after lunch, when she came back, um, we had agreed that she would go to one of the staff people there for a set of fresh eyes and for that level of perspective you know, that they have. Because of, they just have done so many of these cases, maybe they can see something that that I just wasn't seeing or that they weren't seeing when I talked to them about it. But you can live in actual hell. And, uh, and it's not enough for us because the gangs that we literally exported to Central America in the 90s and the drug trade that we fuel and the damage that we have wreaked and the fact that we're fucking neighbors and supposed to be the lead country in the West. Um, you know. I mean, the argument is we can't airlift in every poor kid in the red zone. Yeah, I guess in theory we can't. Um, have we tried? Um, the afternoon case started off seeming similarly impossible. Things weren't adding up. Um, and then she broke down. And started talking about the way that she'd been treated at various points in her life. And it was because I had steered her to her childhood. This is always a place to go. This woman has been ridiculed on the street, literally, all of her life. She's been fired. She's had partners who beat her and claimed that it was because she was an indigenous pendeja. When I asked the Guatemalan woman, this woman's from Honduras, 
But when I asked the Guatemalan woman in the morning, when she said that yes, because she is indigenous, um, she hears you know people make comments and slurs and call her Indian. I said, well, what's the worst thing that you've been called? Because obviously, you know, that's our strongest case right there. That's where we go. And she said, oh, Indian's the worst thing you can call anyone in Guatemala. In Honduras, they throw in monkey a lot, too. But every aspect of this woman's life has been shaped by the extraordinary bias she has received and a hatred and animus and violence based on her race. And then as it ends up, even the critical factor here, which was the thing that made her leave, the attempted rape of her daughter, and hearing that the guy was about to get out of jail for th after 30 days because it was just attempted rape of a nine-year-old, not actual rape of a nine-year-old. The thing that made her leave was that she heard he was getting out and that he had sworn to kill that Indian bitch and her Indian kid. And as horrible as it sounds, there was a part of me that heard that and thought, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God you've been treated horribly all of your life because of race and not just because you live in extraordinary poverty in a hell war zone, right? Fleeing from war is supposed to be one of the things that we created asylum for. But we don't recognize it as a war when it's, you know, MS-13 and Barrio 18 and and little bastard stepchildren all over the place. Anyway, I think she's gonna be fine. But I had to spend four hours with her, talking her through the worst and most horrible moments of her life, as I've had to do again and again this week. But, um, she's illiterate. First illiterate client I've had this week. And really smart. And very brave. But, you know, various points in her story, she would tell me things where it's like, damn girl, you were thinking ahead. You were making a plan. That is good. Um, you got this. And so, you know, um, she totally understood the importance of being this candid with the officer on Tuesday because this is the part of her case that will get her asylum. I was like, I will never ask you to say anything that's not true because they won't believe it. You'll get caught, and I would be a shitty lawyer if I told you to do that. I said, what I'm telling you is, this is the part you should not forget to mention of your true story. And this is the part of your true story that you need to recognize is the most important part. And it was nice to be able to tell somebody with that kind of conviction because race is one of the few things, um, it's still one of the, the most unimpeachable reasons, categories, right? For seeking asylum. Um, and I told her I was sorry that I made her think of these things and talk about them. And that I hope very soon she's able to forget them entirely and never be reminded of them again. But that while she's in the asylum process, it's part of why she's eligible for asylum. And then I told her to think about the good people who she had mentioned in her story. From the really nice neighbor when they were growing up and their parents were both working all day and um, they couldn't afford to go to school, so they didn't. And she was helping take care of her you know, babies 
baby brothers and sisters because she was six and that's one of the older ones. And so they were running around in the street and getting harassed and called names. But they had a very nice neighbor, a lady who would invite them in and would help with diapering and changing and feeding the babies and would make them rice and beans. So I told her to remember her and this woman then all of a sudden she's really, she's been so tough. She's, when I say she broke down, I mean a couple of tears rolled down and she was very hesitant to speak. But all of a sudden she was just sobbing openly when I told her to think of that woman. And the woman who, when she was taken to the hospital, when her first abusive partner had almost killed her, the woman who had a phone, was one of the only people in that village who had a phone, and called her mother, and had her mother wire money, and gave some of her own money, so that she had a bus ticket straight out of town from the hospital. And another woman, guys, you really need to step up here, but another woman who, when she came to cross the bridge in Hidalgo, and they told her at the border point, and again with these fucking border agents fucking lying, that she could not come into this country, that there was no asylum for her in this country, and that if she didn't immediately return to the Mexico side, they were gonna have to call Mexican officials to come get her and take her into Mexico. And she sat down and her nine-year-old daughter sat down and she said, I'm not going anywhere. I'll sit here for a month. And after they'd been there for several hours, a woman came from a local charity and um, brought her some soup for her and her kid and some water and told them that they were gonna be okay and that all of her people were praying for these people. So, right now it feels like there's a lot more bastards than soup women and rice and beans women and neighbors wiring your mom calling your mom. But maybe it doesn't take as many of us as it takes of them. Maybe it just takes three or four of us in this woman's lifetime to help her hang on until she gets to a better place with her girl. So, it is not lost on me that my last two cases of this work this week or indigenous women. <sighs> because we've got a lot of call suggesting to them that they can't go wherever the hell they damn well please. <laughs>